talking about talking about the subject of geocentricity. A biblical consideration is geocentricity biblical? The purpose is to present a biblically based concept that the Earth is the dynamic and the stationary center of the created universe. Unlike what we hear from science today, I believe the what Bible teaches the Earth to be the dynamic and the stationary center of the created universe. This is known as geocentricity. Historically, it was perhaps known as geocentrism. Those who believed it were known as geocentrics. I'd like to give credit and special thanks to Dr. Jerry Baum, who we had at the conference in October, who wrote Geocentricity, the Biblical Cosmology. This was the reference material I used to put together the slideshow. It was published by the Association for Biblical Astronomy, Astronomy in Cleveland, Ohio. Question, which do we look to first for facts and truth? We're always looking for facts and truth, Lord willing. But which do we look to first for facts and truth? Modern theoretical science in areas such as chemistry, biology, or physics. Do you want to know something about biology? Where do you look to first? Modern theoretical science? Or the Bible, written by the very hand of God. Where do you look to first in the area of physics? Do you look to the Bible first? Now you're going to read, or perhaps you read National Geographic, or the latest magazine of Science Today or something. The question could be asked, has modern theoretical science proven the Bible wrong? That's a worthy question. I would say it hasn't, but it's a worthy question. Romans 3, 4 says, let God be true, but every man a liar. I hope to show God's truth this morning and expose man's error, or at least man's weakness. Now, we have a written record through divine revelation. We hold that in our hand. We also have the observable evidence throughout nature around us. One is called, very commonly, the Book of God or the Bible. The other is known as the Book of Nature. Throughout writings and articles, both are universally claimed to be written by the Creator. We have the evidence around us. Many of you may have heard the term, the book of nature. Nothing wrong with the term. It's simply the observable evidence we have around us. But what happens when the observed evidence from nature conflicts? Uh-oh. When it conflicts with the holy word of God. Which one is absolutely accurate? Or neither accurate? Perhaps both. Caution. Our observation of that which is around us can only be through the eyes of fallen man. Maybe the nature is perfect, or at least due to the fall it's not perfect anymore. Maybe it was created perfect, but our observation can be limited, or it can be skewed. We must always be willing to consider our interpretation as being faulty. I'll stand on the purity of the Word of God. Maybe my interpretation is inaccurate. Do you, I think it's fair to be willing to admit that. The creation itself came from the Creator who speaks of it in His Word. We've got the creation, the Creator, and His written Word. We must find harmony between these three things. And we do. There is harmony. Two questions for us today. Do you view the Bible as your rule for faith and practice? Certainly everybody views it as your rule for religion. It's our religious textbook, as it were. How do we learn about God and the story of redemption? But is it your rule for practice in areas such as social, the political, or the scientific? Is it your social guideline? Is it your political rule book or your scientific textbook? Is it? If it's not, that's okay, but is it? Number two, do you believe the Bible to be accurate, perfect, and complete? Those are strong words. Either it's accurate or it's not. Either it's perfect or it's not. Some would say one version is as good as another. And I say, no, they are not. Not all Bible versions are equal uh, or just as good as one another. We could go into the debate of the Alexandrian text versus the Textus Receptus. That's not for today, but be aware there's a debate raging throughout the church. With that said, I am without apology a believer in the accuracy and purity of the King James Bible, authorized version 1611. All the scriptural references shown will be direct quotes from the KJV. Psalm 12, 6 through 7 says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Pure, purified, and preserved. Amen. Now, perhaps not all versions or translations will support the doctrine of geocentricity. What I consider to be my responsibility within this presentation is to prove, prove beyond any doubt the concept of geocentricity is affirmed and taught in the King James Bible. If your version doesn't support it, get a King James Version. 
Now beware. During this presentation, I will try my best to weaken your faith, your faith, which is merely a religious belief, in modern theoretical science. I'm going to try to weaken your faith in theory, not in fact or in truth, but in theory. I'm going to try to weaken your faith in theory. And at the same time, I hope to build your faith in the Word of God to its highest level. Weaken in theory, build it on truth. Now, a word about context. Due diligence on the part of the hearer, on your part, is to make sure that I'm not allowed to, to use a verse in any way that disagrees with the context of that verse. Most of the quotations I'll give you will be singled out verse references. So you will leave here with homework. Make sure I didn't take a, a, a verse out of its context or use it in an inappropriate way. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What scripture, when he says all scripture, what scripture is Paul talking about here? The New Testament wasn't even written yet. It must mean the Old Testament. Some people throw out the Old Testament. Both testaments must be seen to be authoritative. And we're going to look at both testaments today. So let's go right to the creation. We're going to talk about geo, earth, centricity, the center, the earth being the center of the creation. So where did the earth come from? Here we have the creation account. And we'll read right through it. Genesis 1, 1 through 10. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night. The evening and the morning were the first day. God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Here we have in detail the creation of earth. At what point in the creation account we just read did the Lord start the earth spinning on its axis? We, as we picture the earth spinning like a top on its axis, where was that? Where did it begin? Another question, how could the earth have orbited a sun that wasn't created for two more days? Why was it orbiting? Something that wasn't even there. As we understand from science, the earth is in the sun's gravitational pull. Where? How? Let's head right to the scripture and look for motions of the world. Is this world we know? Is the earth moving? Let's look to scripture. Psalm 93 1 says, The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty, the Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself, the world also be established that it cannot be moved. Here we see the Hebrew term for world, tabel, the earth as moist and therefore inhabited by extension, the globe, what we know to be planet earth. But notice the old English term established being used, not the more common word established. Yeah. The Hebrew word for established, kun, to be erect, hence causatively to set up, but it's used in a great variety of applications. This means the world itself has been stabilized, not simply begun, which would have been implied by the term established. This stabilization of the world itself, the globe, planet Earth that it cannot be moved. The Hebrew word for moved, moat, a primitive root, to waver, to slip, shake, fall, to be carried or cast, that it cannot be carried or cast. In other words, if we're in the, in the sun's gravitational pull, that's something of a carrying. We're being carried. The Bible says the world is stabilized, that it wouldn't be carried, that it wouldn't be cast, as it were. That's scripture right there. The only reference to the world's motion is to say that there is no motion. 1 Corinthians 8.13 Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Aha, uh -huh, I've got you now, standeth. The Bible says the earth, the world standeth. That proves geocentricity. The world doesn't spin nor orbit, it standeth. Here's the importance of going back to the original text. The Greek term for world is aheon. Simply an age, by extension, perpetuity, by implication, it's simply the world. It's while the, the world remains, while it's, it's, it's fulfilling its function as created by the Lord. 
while the Earth remains in its present function is a way to it, draw that out, this passage, according to the Greek, cannot, be, cannot demand a conclusion of geocentricity. I could try and force it if, if maybe I could sneak one by you and say, ah, don't you know the Bible says the world standeth? That means it's standing still. I would be forcing something that the Greek doesn't allow for. This is not a strong geocentric passage. It just isn't. I wanted to show you how some people might trick you with the Bible, but going back to the original text, I'm not, I, would, I, would be, I would be disproven very easily if I tried to stand on that text. Mm -hmm. It's a weak geocentric passage. Motion, perhaps there's motions of the world to come. First Chronicles 16.30, fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it, that it be not moved. Now we have also, so two things are stable, that also shall be stable. Some commentaries <coughs> suggest this is a future reference of the world to come because the terms also and shall are, are used. Grammatically, we have to identify what are these two objects. It's either the earth and the world also, either the earth and the world are stable, or the world fit at present, or the world to come also shall be stable. In any case, no matter how you slice it, in any case it is clear that neither the world at present, which is physical, nor the world to come, which is spiritual, is in any way moving. From the grammar, it, it must be so. The same Hebrew terms are repeated from Psalm 93. Psalm 96.10, say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth, the same phrase we see, the world also is established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. The same Hebrew terms repeated yet again. Check all these terms if you'd like it at home. Check, they're all easily found in Strong's Concordance, the definitions of them, the other uses. Um, online now there's amazing help. So you can find out all the different um, way terms are used. I, do your research. First part of Hebrews 12, 28 says, Wherefore, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. The world to come cannot be moved. Hence, the world we have now is not moving. How blessed to know the world in the eternity to come will never be shaken or removed. That's a blessed promise right there. Perhaps there are motions of the earth. We look for motions of the world <laughs> through the text. Perhaps there are motions of the earth. Psalm 104, 5, speaking of the Lord, who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. Note the conditional attitude of the verse. It does not say it will not be removed. It says that it should not be removed. The conditional nature of this verse does not allow it to be a strong geocentric reference. However, it does show the mind of God and that he would be pleased to have the earth remain in place as it was created. Isaiah 13, 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens, the Lord says, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and the day of his fierce anger. The Hebrew for remove raw ash to undulate, specifically to spring as a locust. Only in judgment do we see potential movement of the earth. Dr. Bow said, the Bible teaches that it is man's sin which causes the conditions to change so that the earth will ultimately be removed. There is movement. It would ultimately be removed even though it was founded so that it should never be removed to spring as a locust out of its place at the final judgment. Psalm 82 5. They know not, that is the heathen, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations are out of course. So far we've looked for language within the text of Scripture that would indicate movement of the earth. In nature we observe movement. We see the sun moving through the heavens. We've got the moon, the stars seem to be moving. The question we need to answer is, what is moving? Perhaps this passage proves the earth has a course of orbital trajectory. The earth, the foundation of the earth, are they're out of course. Aha, uh -huh. see that course? They're out of it. That means there's some kind of a path. But notice the first verse of Psalm 82, as well as the last verse. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Verse 5 is the passage we looked at. The foundations of the earth are out of course. And the final verse to the psalm, verse 8, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Clearly a psalm of judgment. And notice, the earth is not to be set out of course, but rather the foundations of the earth are out of course. Namely, that Christ was the foundation. That was removed by man's sin, as Dr. Bow said, it's man's sin that causes the conditions to change. So I say to you, this cannot be seen as movement uh, in an orbital trajectory by the Earth. 
Isaiah 24, 19 and 20. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. Verse 20, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. and shall be removed like a cottage. How many times have to pluck up a tent and throw it out? Just like a little cottage, as we saw to spring as a locust, when the Lord removes the earth in judgment. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it. It shall fall and not rise again. Again, the language used here must be seen as a judgment, not a literal moving. Here's a question. Can staggering as a drunk, if you're trying to prove Earth's orbit from the Bible, can staggering as a drunk be taken as precise orbital motions? What kind of an analogy is that? What kind of a parallel? What does a drunk do the same way twice when he's staggering? Yeah, I don't think you're going to prove it from Scripture. Psalm 11990. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. The Hebrew term for abideth, ahmad, to stand, various relations to stand, remain, to endure, to take one stand. Where would anyone hope to find an orbiting earth from these passages? An earth whipping through space. Scripture is consistent and clear. The earth of the world remains in place as it was created. Job 26, 7 says, He stretcheth out, that is the Lord, stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Amen. Hangeth the earth upon nothing. The Hebrew for nothing, <coughs> the Lima, nothing whatever. Nothing whatever. That's the earth. Is the earth really being led around by the sun's gravitational pull? If it's hung upon nothing. If it is true that the earth has no orbit and remains in its place, could the earth perhaps rotate or move within its set place and not violate the scriptures we've seen? Let's look at two verses which might seem to indicate there is perhaps movement of the stationary earth. Psalm 99, 1. The Lord reigneth. Let the people tremble. That is the heathen. Let the, the heathen, those who don't know the Lord, tremble. He sitteth between the cherubim, a place of judgment. Let the earth be moved. The Hebrew for moved here, mute, to quake. Let, let the unrighteous shake in fear of a holy and righteous judgment. Here we see something of a spiritual sense of movement, particularly on the part of the heathen who dwell on earth. Job 9 and 6, which shaketh the earth out of her place. That is the wrath of God, which shaketh the earth out of her place, the pillars thereof tremble. The Hebrew for shaketh, ragaz, to quiver with any violent motion, especially anger or fear, to be afraid, to stand in awe, threat, or rage. Out of her place comes from the Hebrew makam, a standing. It can also be figurative, a condition of body or mind. Note the emotional nature of the terms used. To be afraid, to fret, to rage, a condition of body or mind. I say to you, this is a, to, to look at this properly, it's a, it's, a, a, it's a moving in fear, a proper quaking, a trembling at a holy and righteous God. This verse is most commonly seen as a spiritual judgment and a movement which shaketh the earth out of her place. That is the judgment of God. Now, even if the earth were to physically shake or tremble, in what way, in what way could that be taken as revolving on a daily precise basis? Scriptural movement. The Bible does indeed to refer to the earth's movement. It's not fair to say the Bible says the earth doesn't move. The Bible does say the earth moves. But what is that movement? It's a spiritual judgment. A quaking in fear. How can one conclude the movement described that we've just seen as being orbit and daily rotation? I wouldn't want to try to prove that from the scriptures we've seen. If somebody tried to force that on the Bible. Hezekiah's sign. In three different books we read the account of King Hezekiah's illness and the miracle sign he requested and received. Once again, in nature we observe movement. The question we need to answer is what is movement? We've seen that the earth is established, that it cannot be moved, that it will stay in place, even if it quakes and trembles in, in judgment. We've seen the earth stand still, according to the Bible. Will there be scriptural evidence of the sun moving through the heavens? Something's moving. We need to answer what is moving. 2 Kings 20, 9 through 11. And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have in the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken. Shall... The shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees. Hezekiah answered, it is a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. It always goes down. Every day it goes down. It's a light thing. It's common. But let the shadow return backward 
10 degrees. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Ahaz was King Hezekiah's father who erected a sundial and it was as accurate as sundials can be. What did happen? Historically, scholars have interpreted this as indicating the sun backed up 10 degrees in its daily path, then continued in its regular descent from that point on. That particular day would have been 40 minutes longer than a normal day, but not all agree that such is the correct interpretation. So let's we'll go back and pick up some clues. But lay the, nay, let the shadow return backward. So he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down. From this passage, it could be concluded that an optical illusion occurred on the sundial itself, witnessed only, essentially, by King Hezekiah. He saw the miracle, the Lord blessed him with it, it was a sign from the Lord. But we've got another couple more passages to look at. Second Chronicles, and telling of the story, 32-24 says, In those days Hezekiah was sick to the death, and he prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. Later on in the chapter, verse 31, How be it in the business of the ambassadors for the princes of Babylon, who sent unto King Hezekiah to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. Here's the phrase, to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. Perhaps land here could mean the miracle was seen only on the sundial of Hezekiah, or perhaps the land of Israel itself. The land of Israel only, not a worldwide event. We have one more passage to search for additional details. Isaiah 38, 7 and 8. And this shall be a sign unto thee that from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backwards. So the sun returned 10 degrees. By which degrees? It was gone down. Now we've got a full view of what happened to Hezekiah, to the land of Israel, and everywhere in the world. The sun itself returned or moved backwards, completely miraculous, by 10 degrees. Not just the sundial, not just the shadow, the sun. The sun returned. At last we found scriptural language of movement. The earth it doesn't move. The sun returned. It it is stated to be that which moved. It's not the earth that unrotated or unrevolved. The sun returned 10 degrees, by which degrees it was gone down. Let's look at Joshua's long day, a similar miracle in the life of Israel, the nation of Israel. In Joshua chapter 10, we find the battle between a host of enemy kings and the alliance of Israel with Gibeon. Now consider the implications of the earth stopping its rotation. If you're walking with a bowl of water, and you stop all of a sudden, what's going to happen to that water? It's just going to wave, it's going to form a wave and splash right out. The oceans would overflow when the rotation suddenly stopped. Now the Lord could have performed a miracle that the oceans didn't overflow, but how, how easy to consider the sun simply halting in place. There's the miracle, the sun's moving and it just stops. How much easier to consider rather than trying to formulate the earth unrotated and all the, all the implications of it. So let's look at it, Joshua 10. Verse 12 through 14. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said, that is, Joshua said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed at his command by the power of God until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. What stopped? Notice the language of what happened. In order for something to stop, it must first have been moving. The sun is clearly stated to stand Still, the moon also in its movement is stayed. But two more verses refer to this event. Habakkuk 3.11, the, the sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Here we have a prayer of Habakkuk rehearsing, recalling the great deeds done by our Lord on behalf of his people. Job 9.7, which commandeth the sun and it riseth not and sealeth up the stars. Here we have a prophetic reference from Job declaring the power of the Creator over His creation. Now let's look at Christ and the Son. 
Webster's 1828 defines analogy. We're going to have a, an analogy between Christ and the Son. An agreement or likeness between things in some circumstances or effects when the things are otherwise entirely different. <coughs> Christ is entirely different from the Son. But yet there are certain agreements or likenesses between the two. And Scripture is going to use that. Analogies are a common grammatical tool used by our Lord throughout the Bible. Making use of ordinary circumstances or objects, we're given glimpses of what Christ is like and what he will do. The, the Father is no, um, speaks of gathering the, us as, as chicks under his wing. As a hen gathers chicks under her wing, so the Lord treats us. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes down as a dove. The Holy Spirit isn't a dove, but we're given these images uh, from ordinary events that we might understand who God is. Psalm 84:11. For the Lord God is a son. That's the correct spelling. All these are the correct spelling, I guarantee you, from the King James Version. The Lord God is a son and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will they hold from them that walk uprightly. Here we have beautiful imagery creating a connection between our Savior and His glorious creation, the sun. Consider the analogies, the brightness. Is there anything brighter than the sun we have and we see each day? I can see the, 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 the sunshine outside. Is there anything brighter than the glory of Christ himself? How powerful is a sunrise? Who can stop the sunrise? Who can stop Christ when he comes to reclaim his church? Thank the Lord. Who can stop him? Who is greater than any other? The sun is the greatest mass in our, in our universe. And how great, greater than any other is Christ who lives and, lives and dwells inside of us. Psalm 19, 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth, uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. Verse 3, there is no speech nor no language where their voice, that is the heaven's voice, is not heard. Verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. The sun, verse 5, which is the bridegroom, Coming out of his chamber, rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Verse 6, his going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit yeah. unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. We're talking about the sun. But can you see we're talking about Christ? Historically, this psalm is seen as messianic and Christological. Where he's looking at run a race, going forth. According to the rules of analogy, Usage, there must be a natural parallel to the supernatural subject. I don't know if anyone's going to deny this isn't talking about Christ himself. Bridegroom coming for his church, for his bride, rejoices in the strong man <coughs> going forth. Yet it's talking, it must also be talking about the sun due to the use of analogy. Notice the language of movement ascribed to the sun in verse 4. It runs a race, it goes forth, and it has a circuit. Now that sounds more like an orbit to me than the staggerings of a drunkard. Isaiah 13, 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened, and in his going forth the moon shall not cause her light to shine. In a context of judgment and wrath, here again we see the sun is going forth. Judges 5, 31. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. And the land had rest 40 years. Do you want to know how we're to push the crown right to King Jesus? Go forth as the sun. Yes. As it comes in the morning. It's the power and the glory of the sunrise. That is how we are to press the crown right. Remember the use of analogy. Consider the might of Christ's coming. The glory of Christ's coming. The glory of the sunrise. We're given the sun as evidence every day of what Christ's return will be like. Of the power of it. The majesty of it. Every day you're given evidence to, to look to. Malachi 4.2 But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, clearly speaking of Christ, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Clearly a Christological reference, but notice the parallel between the Son's motion and the Son's motion. There's a parallel there. If the sun is to be an analogy of rising, surely it must be moving. Perhaps it could be argued that the sun's motion here, sun of righteousness arise, is only figurative. It, you know, I've, I've reduced some passages to a spiritual uh, definition. It's only figurative, not physical or literal. But with what authority do we claim a risen Lord and yet deny a rising sun? With what authority? What, 
how, how can we pull that off? The analogy of the sun to the sun demands motion of both objects, or else you're denying the resurrection, and no one here is doing that. It must be. A quick review. Look, we've seen the world as being stabilized according to Scripture. The world to come will never be moved. The earth now trembles in judgment. There is movement. The earth will at some point be removed due to man's sin in the final day. The sun is used as an analogy of Christ. The sun goes forth and has a circuit. Christ has surely risen, so must the sun. The world as we know it has from the creation remained in place while the sun orbits the earth each and every day. Consider the term sunrise and sunset. It's a good song as well. There are 30 scriptural references to the sun rising. Yes. There are 26 references to the sun going down or setting. Mm -hmm. The movement inherent to the terms rise and set must be acknowledged. Dr. Bao said, more accurately, if the sun stands still and the earth is moving, the term should be to sun during the day, from sun at night. We would have sunrise and sunset. We would have to sun, from sun. No, that the earth is the one moving. As it were, just a thought. Geocentricity. The central tenet of geocentricity is that the Earth is the dynamic center of the universe. Scripture must be consistent in its use of terms such as up, down, below, or above. Consider also the phrase throughout Ecclesiastes, under the sun. If the Earth is not central to the universe, these terms of proximity or points of reference cannot be applied to the Earth. If the sun is the central, anything away from it would be up from the sun. Yet throughout scripture and throughout life, anything, we, we just use it commonly. Anything up towards the heavens is up from our point of reference. Anything below us is down. Yeah. Scripture is consistent. The earth is central. Yeah. Let's look at the ordinances of heaven. These kind of get in, in the way for some people. Job 38, 33 says, Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? He's asking Job. Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you set them in effect on the earth? Heliocentrists, those who believe the earth is the center of the universe, call upon this verse as proof for the, the laws of gravity. They say, aha, see the ordinances of heaven? That's the laws of gravity. That's the laws of gravity which rule and regulate the celestial body. Scripture speaks of it. The laws of gravity throughout the heavens. Ordinances of heaven. Well, Scripture has the ordinances of heaven. Question for us, what are these ordinances and what effect do they have? Notice the ordinances are not currently in effect on earth. We have the, the, the ordinances of heaven not currently in effect. Hence the term can't, not has. He says, can you put them into effect? Can you set the dominion thereof? It's not have you set the dominion thereof, but it's can you. Hence they are not currently in effect on earth. Since gravity is already functioning on earth, it cannot be seen as an ordinance of heaven referred to here. It's not defined as an ordinance of heaven. Scripture defines the difference between that which is earthly and that which is heavenly. Notice Matthew 6.10, a very familiar portion. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord's will is already being done in heaven. But we're to pray that it's done on earth as well. Two different things, earthly and heavenly. Let's look, look at another scriptural distinction between that which is earthly and heavenly. 1 Corinthians 15, 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. <clears throat> With this distinction, the ordinances of heaven from Job 38 cannot be restricted or equated to what is properly called the laws of physics. Those laws of physics are earthly. We cannot ascribe them to the heavenly activities. Notice these laws of physics are merely the traditions of men garnered, as I said before, from fallen man's observations of nature. They are not God's inviolable laws or ordinances. Now what we see from the laws of physics, the laws of gravity, they, 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 they stand true under, under testing and observation, but woe to us if we call upon them as God's laws. Nothing wrong with the laws of gravity or the, the observation, the traditions of men. But let's not ascribe to them that the Lord himself made them. They're not God's inviolable laws or ordinances. They're simply men's traditions. And there's nothing wrong with that. I hope no one, that doesn't offend anyone. 
Notice an ordinance of heaven is defined by scripture. Here's scriptural definitions of the ordinances. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 35, and 36. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea, the sea when the waves are of war, the Lord of hosts is his name. Verse 36. If those ordinances, those ordinances which you just saw, depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Jeremiah speaks to us of how light is produced and for what purpose. Let's look at it again. With the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light, the moon and the stars for a light by night. There's the ordinances. That's all they are. They're simply the ordinances of heaven. Notice the original ordinance of heaven in Genesis 1, 14 and 15. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be. Here's God's command. This is His ordinance over His creation. Let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Here's an ordinance of earth as defined by Scripture. Genesis 8:22. While the earth remaineth, our Lord Himself speaking, while the earth remaineth, seed time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day and night shall not cease. Yeah. There's an ordinance. Yeah. That's not a tradition of man. That is a God-ordained system put in place. His, that's his promise. Here we have an ordinance of earth guaranteed by our Lord. You can bet your last dollar on that one. Yeah. We can rest and rely on the fact that these will hold true. So we have the ordinances. The sun is a light for the day. These are the ordinances as scripturally defined. The light is a sun for the day. The moon and stars are lights for the night. The means by which that light is produced, the Lord himself. The celestial bodies are for signs. The seasons as well as day or night shall not cease until the end of the earth. Notice this. Regularity of planetary and satellite motion or rotation is not a biblical ordinance. I don't have a, of a promise from the word of God that says there will be regularity. It's not there. What, what we've seen, a, a scriptural definition of the ordinance is, this is not one of them. Regularity of planetary movement, it's not promised. We see it, we see it as being consistent, but it's not promised. Two different things. Biblical heliocentrism. Perhaps there's some evidence that the sun is the center. It might be noted that I'm somewhat biased in my presentation. I, maybe I'm giving you one half of the verses. I'm not, uh, I'm hiding some stuff from you. I encourage you to do your own study. See? See what else is out there. To be fair, let's look at a verse that is often used to support the concept that the earth is revolving or rotating daily. Job 38, 12 to 14. Thou hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. It, that is the earth, it is turned as clay to the seal and they stand as a garment. Aha, the earth is turned, rotated like a potter's clay. Notice I'm the one infusing the term potter into this, into the context. It says nothing of potter's clay. It simply says the earth is turned as clay to the seal. Let's look at it more closely. Here's the phrase. The Hebrew term for turn, hotak, to turn about or over by implication to change or to pervert. To change or to pervert. Hebrew for seal, as we might think, oh, the potter's clay, it's sealing, so that way the water won't leak out of it. But notice, going back to the Hebrew, Hebrew for seal, kotham, is a signature ring, the seal of the great of, of Rome, the seal of Rome, the seal of the great state of California. It's a signet, the form. Uh, now we use wax. In the olden days, they used moist <coughs> clay. So the imagery we have is, as the morning sunshine, before dawn, the, the silhouette of the mountains is dark, and there's, there's, there's very little form there. There's very little uh, you know, distinction you can see. But as the morning sunshine changes the face of the earth, so too the moist clay, when impressed from the signet, is changed to the form of the signet. So when the sunrise comes up, all of a sudden the mountains are illuminated. The, the, the little definitions show up. Just so too the moist clay is changed to form the signet. I say to you, this is not referring to a potter's wheel and the earth being spun. Um, the Hebrew terms right. don't allow for it. Right. They do not. Now, what is at stake in all of this? The inerrant nature of Scripture is on trial. If, if someone here doesn't believe in Scripture, I've given you more evidence. 
uh, against the Bible than anything else. Question is, has modern theoretical science proven the Bible wrong? So let's look at modern theoretical science, what we've been fighting. Uh, throughout this presentation. I've given you the authority of Scripture. I've gone through the verses. Now that we consider the Scriptures germane to our topic, let's move on to some applications for today. In contrast to the authority of the Bible, you have the claims, the claims of modern theoretical science. Now notice, I hope no one's offended by modern theoretical science. To be modern is not wrong. There's nothing wrong there. To be ancient doesn't make it better. That's right. To be modern is not wrong. To have a theory is not a failure. No, there's no insult in, in, in theoretical considerations. To, be, to have a th theory is not a failure. Science is not a false term. It's simply not knowledge. There's nothing wrong. I uh, hope nobody balks at modern theoretical science. But where do we put our faith? I've given you the authority of Scripture versus modern theoretical science. It's a simple question. Where do you put your faith? What has science proven? That's a valid question. What is the center of the Earth? Somebody give me an answer. What is the center? The equator. Somebody give me an answer. The primary. Okay, Dad says hell. According to science, what do we have? The point of zero gravity. The point of zero gravity. Okay, of, of what material does, does the center Magma. of the Earth core. Magma. Magma. Magma core. All right. When I was in school, they said it was molten iron. You read the latest stuff now, they say it's rocky. It was. It, it, when I was in school, it was molten iron. Now the latest articles in Science Today, now they're claiming it was rocky. They don't know. Perhaps the Bible has an answer. Jeremiah 31, 37 says, Thus saith the Lord of heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of earth searched out beneath. I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. We can't know what's in the middle. They're guessing. They're speculating. They said it was molten iron magma. Now they say it's yeah, probably rocky. There are mysteries to the creation that we will never know or for certain or prove. They will never be able to predict an earthquake, according to Jeremiah 31. They said, we're not going to know. You can watch all the, the hour-long specials on the, you know, the, the history program, the nature program, about um, predicting earthquakes. I watched one. It took a whole hour. They, they, they sent probes down to San Andreas. They were trying to figure out how do we predict an earthquake. And it would save lives. People would be blessed by it. They're not going to do it. They'll never predict an earthquake. The Lord says the foundation of the earth cannot be searched out beneath. But to what is science held, is held accountable? They taught me it was magma, molten iron. Now they're saying it's rocky. It's changed. That's not fair. The law of God never changes. Truth according to science is always changing. What is science? But knowledge, it's, it's the term, it's always changing. They teach lies until they're proven wrong. Now it's not a lie to have a theory but when you push a theory as being truth, that's a lie. So the moon's not made out of cheese? Yeah. <laughs> Cream cheese, right? Modern theoretical science. Is the sun the center of the universe? That's a valid question. Each of you were probably taught the sun is the stationary center of the universe. Mm -hmm. Now they say the sun itself is moving through space at 140 miles a second. In my presentation here, it's moved thousands of miles according to the modern theoretical science. There's a theory about it, of why the sun's moving. When I was in school, they said it was stationary. Now they're saying it's shooting through faster than you can believe. The popular view now is to say there is no center of the universe, or we don't even know what the center is. They're guessing. They're still in a theoretical stage. Yeah. What causes gravity? That's a, that's a question we need to know every day. After centuries of trying, science has yet to prove why gravity occurred. There's tons of theory about it. Theories all over the place. They've yet to prove it. How much money and effort has been pushed to prove evolution? They've yet to prove it. We know they never will. A system designed to reject a creator. After 500 years, science, after the Copernican revolution, <coughs> revolution, Copernicus was the original man who said the sun is the center, the planets revolve around it. So after 500 years after Copernicus, science has yet to prove the theory that removes the centrality of the earth Christ came to save. The Bible speaks of the earth as being central. Here's some questions for you. Why does matter, from modern theoretical science, why does matter exert a gravitational force? We observe the force, but why? Electron spin. Fair. So we've got an answer there. I'm going to still say it's a theory. <laughs> why, does, why does a charge have an electric field? We notice it does have an electric field, but why? What is light? 
Is it matter? Is it particle? Is it wave? What is it? Modern theory, there's theories out there. What is it? If you didn't have electric field, you wouldn't have water. There. Are, are you I'm asking for answers to these, or are you just throwing them out? I'm just throwing them out there, because I, I, I would maintain these are yet unproven. I got these off the internet. I don't know. I got these off the internet. I don't think they, but I don't think they've explained it, what it's like. I mean, I don't know about this stuff, but I don't think they have. I've heard the, the different theories. We've all heard the theories. I know there are theories. I want fact. I want truth. And I say it's not available. But how do birds migrate? What is, the, what is at the edge of the universe? Then we just see it if, if you can tell... Uh, the stretching out of the heavens from Jeremiah. We're not to know what's at the edge of the universe. Why do some particles have mass while others have none? I don't even understand the nature of that question. <laughs> what is the complete structure and function of the pro... How did you say that? Proteome? Proteome. Proteome. What is it? Is accurate long-range weather forecasting possible? These are... There's theories about it. There's no proof. No truth. There are heliocentric proofs that scientists come up with. Here are a few of the more famous attempts, just so you know the terminology, don't get thwarted by it. These are more famous attempts to prove the Earth is orbiting and revolving. Keep in mind, all have been proven inconclusive. They've not been proven wrong, but inconclusive. I say to you, the authority of the Bible says the Earth is stationary and the sun moves. Science, all of science gives you inconclusive. I give you the authority of the Bible, Science gives you inconclusive. Now here, yet they're taught as fact and proof. They're inconclusive. The stellar aberration. Oh, once they figured out stellar aberration, it proved the Earth was moving. Star streaming. That proves the Earth is moving. Parallax. Polarization. The Foucault pendulum. The Doppler effect. All the, oh, once we figured out the Doppler effect, it proves the Earth is moving. It's all taken care of now. It's been proven. The Bible's all wrong. Fresnel's drag, Aries failure. I didn't even call it that. That's, that's the common term throughout science, Aries failure. The Michelson-Morley experiment. Just so you know, all these have been proven inconclusive. They don't prove we're moving. Once again, modern theoretical science. Why have we bought into the idea that science has facts, truth, and answers? I gave you the authority of the Word of God this morning. Why buy into science? Who created all things? The Lord himself. Where should we look for knowledge? Namely, his word. If you find evidence that satisfies you from science that disproves the Bible, I beg of you to establish the source of that data. Right. Most educators, now not all, not all, but most educators and modern theoretical scientists are devout atheists and evolutionists. Mm -hmm. They're devout, not all, but most. Are these the men you look to for facts and truth? You've got no. the Bible. Do you look to those men, the modern, latest, you know, articles in the Science Today or whatever it might be? Why not believe the Lord and His Word? Remember the questions I asked you? Do you believe the Bible is your rule for faith and practice, areas such as social, political, or the scientific? I hope to show you the Bible is a scientific textbook. It gives you truth, not theory. It gives you truth. Do you believe the Bible to be accurate, perfect, and complete? If you are looking for reasons why the Bible is kind of outdated, no longer usable, I'm giving you that evidence. If you're holding to modern theoretical science, I've, I've shown you the Bible, you know. You are, during this presentation, I've tried my best to weaken your faith in modern theoretical science. I hope I've done that. And at the same time, I hope I've built your faith in the Word of God to its highest level. I encourage you, look up any of this information. You can go on Google, you can look it up anywhere. Search the scriptures, first of all. Be a Solomon who gave his heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. What else could we, could I, could I, you know, uh, implore you to do? But search the scriptures. Prove these things. Have you been challenged with biblical truth today? I stand only on the authority of scripture. That's all I've come, come to you today, is the authority of scripture. If it is wrong, I am wrong. Or perhaps my interpretation was wrong. I'll leave that venue open as well. Yes. But if it is wrong, I'm wrong. I'll go down with it. I'll go down on that ship. Look for yourself at the context of the verses I presented. It went fast, but make sure I didn't drag anything out uh, from where it should properly be in its context. Once again, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Scripture must be as perfect as God himself. Now, we will all have conclusions based on the information presented here. I encourage you, be certain yours are wholly 
on his word. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Jerry Bow uh, for writing the book, Geocentricity, the Biblical Cosmology. I encourage you to obtain a copy of it for reference materials. It was published by the Association for Biblical Astronomy in Cleveland, Ohio.